Chapter 16 Then began a curious phase in their lives. Borrowings beyond all dreams of borrowing. A golden age. Every night the floor was open and treasures would appear. A real carpet for the sitting room, a tiny coal scuttle, a stiff little sofa with damask cushions, a double bed with a round bolster, a single ditto with a striped mattress, framed pictures instead of stamps, a kitchen stove which didn't work but which looked lovely in the kitchen. There were oval tables and square tables and a little desk with one drawer. There were two maple wardrobes, one with a looking glass and a bureau with curved legs. Homily grew not only accustomed to the roof coming off, but even went so far as to suggest that Pod, to Pod, that he put the board on hinges. It ju- it's just the hammering I don't care for, she explained. It brings down the dirt. When the boy brought them a grand piano, Homily begged Pod to build a drawing room. Next to the sitting room, she said, and we could move the storerooms farther down. Then we could have those gilt chairs he talks about and the palm in the pot. Pod, however, was a little tired of furniture removing. He was looking forward to the quiet evenings when he could doze at last beside the fire in his new red velvet chair. No sooner had he put a chest of drawers in one place when Homily, coming in and out at the door, to get the effect, made him try it somewhere else. And every evening, at his usual time for bedtime, the roof would fly up and more stuff would arrive. But Homily was tireless. Bright-eyed and pink-cheeked, after a long day's pushing and pulling, she still would leave nothing until morning. Let's just try it, she would beg, lifting up one end of the large doll's sideboard so that Pod would have to lift the other. It won't take a minute. But as Pod well knew, in actual fact, it would be several hours before, dishevelled and aching, they finally dropped into bed. Even then, Homily would sometimes hop out to have one last look. In the meantime, in payment for these riches, Arietti would read to the boy. Every afternoon in the long grass beyond the cherry tree, He would lie on his back and she would stand beside his shoulder and tell him when to turn the page. There were happy days to look back on afterwards. With the blue sky beyond the cherry boughs, the grasses softly stirring and the boy's great ear listening beside her. She grew to know that ear quite well, with its curves and shadows and sunlit pinks and golds. Sometimes, as she grew bolder, she would lean against his shoulder. He was very still while she read to him and was always grateful. What worlds they would explore together, strange worlds to Arietti. She learned a lot, and some of the things she learned were hard to accept. She was made to realise once, and for all that this earth on, which they lived turning about in space, did not revolve, as she had believed, for the sake of little people. Nor big people either, she reminded the boy when she, when she saw his secret smile. In the cool of the evening, Pod would come for her a rather weary pod, dishevelled and dusty, to take her back for tea. And at home, there would be an excited homily and fresh delights to discover. Shut your eyes, homily would cry. Now open them. And Arietti, in a dream of joy, would see her home transformed. All kinds of surprises were there even. One day, lace curtains at the grating looped up with pink string. Their only sadness was that there was no one there to see. No visitors, no casual dropper-ins, no admirers, cries or envious glances. What would Homily have not given for an overmantle or a harpsichord? Even a rain barrel would have been better than no one at all. You write to your Uncle Hendreary, Homily suggested, and tell him a nice long letter mind and don't leave anything out. Arietti began the letter on the back of one of the discarded pieces of blotting paper, but it became, as she wrote it, just as dull, just a dull list, far too long, like a sale catalogue, or the inventory of a house to let. She would have to keep jumping up to count spoons, or to look up words in the dictionary, and after a while she laid it aside. There was so much else to do, so many new books to read, and so much now that she could talk of with the boy. He's been ill, she told her mother and father. He's been here for the quiet and the country air, but he'll soon go back to India. Did you know, she asked the amazed homily, that the Arctic night lasts six months and that the distance between the two poles is less than that between the two extremities of a diameter drawn through the equator? Yes, there were happy days, and all would have been well, as Pod said afterwards, if they had stuck to borrowing from the doll's house. No one in the human household seemed to remember it was there, and consequently, nothing was missed. The drawing room, however, 
could not help but be a temptation. It was so seldom used nowadays. There were so many knick-knack tables which had been out of Pod's reach, and the boy, of course, could turn the key in the glass door of the cabinet. The silver violin he brought them first, and then the silver harp. It stood no higher than Pod's shoulder, and Pod restrung it with horsehair from the sofa in the morning room. A musical conversazione, that's what we could have, cried the exulting homily, as Arietti struck a tiny tuneless note on the horse-strung hair. If only, she went on fervently, clasping her hands, your father would start on the drawing room. She curled her hair nearly every evening nowadays, and since the house was more or less straight, she would occasionally change for dinner into a satin dress. It hung like a sack, but homily called it Grecian. We could use your painted ceiling, she explained to Arietti, and there are quite enough of those toy builder bricks to make a parquet floor. Parquet, she would say, parquet, just like a harpsichord. Even Great Aunt Sophie, right away upstairs in the littered grandeur of her bedroom, seemed distantly affected by the spirit of endeavour, which seemed to flow in gleeful whirls and eddies about the staid old house. Several times lately, Pod, when he went to her room, had found her out of bed. He went there nowadays, not to borrow, but to rest. The room, one might say, had become his club, a place which he could go to get away from things. Pod was a little irked by his riches. He had never visualised, not in his wildest dreams, borrowing such as this. Homily, he felt, should call a halt. Surely now their home was grand enough. These jewelled snuff boxes and diamond encrusted miniatures, these filigree vanity cases and Dresden figurines, all as he knew from the drawing room cabinet were not really necessary. What was the good of a shepherdess nearly as tall as Arietti or an outsized candle snuffer? Sitting just inside the fender where he could warm his hands at the fire, he watched Aunt Sophie hobble slowly around the room on her two sticks. She'll be downstairs soon, I shouldn't wonder, he thought glumly, hardly listening to her oft-told tale about a royal luncheon aboard a Russian yacht. Then she'll miss these things. It was not Aunt Sophie, however, who missed them first. It was Mrs Driver. Mrs Driver had never forgotten the trouble over Rosa Pickhatchet. It, it had not been, at the time, easy to pinpoint the guilt. Even Cramphill had felt under suspicion. From now on, Mrs Driver had said, I'll manage on my own. No more strange maids in this house. Not if I'm to stay on myself. A drop of Madeira here, or a pair of old stockings there, a handkerchief or so, an odd vest, an occasional, an occasional pair of gloves. These, Mrs Driver felt, were different. These were within her rights. But trinkets out of the drawing room cabinet that, she told herself grimly, staring at the depleted shelves, was a different story altogether. She felt tricked. Standing there on that fateful day in the spring sunshine, feather duster in hand, her little black eyes had become slits of anger and cunning. It was she calculated, as though someone, suspecting her dishonesty, were trying to catch her out. But who could it be? Cranfield? That boy? The man who came to wind the clocks? These things had disappeared gradually, one by one. It was someone, of that she felt sure, who knew the house, and someone who wished her ill. Could it, she wondered, suddenly, be the old lady herself? The old girl had been out of bed lately and walking around her room. Might she not have come downstairs in the night, poking around with her stick, snooping and spying? Mrs Driver remembered suddenly the empty Madeira bottle and the two glasses which so often were left on the kitchen table. Ah, thought Mrs Driver, was not this just the sort of thing she might do? The sort of thing she would cackle over, back upstairs among her pillows, watching and waiting for Mrs Driver to report the loss. Everything all right downstairs, Driver? That's what she'd always say, and she would look at Mrs Driver sideways out of those wicked old eyes of her. I wouldn't put it past her, Mrs Driver exclaimed aloud, gripping her feather duster as though it were a club. And a nice Mary Andrew she'd look if I caught her, creeping ar around downstairs in the rooms in the middle of the night. All right, my lady, muttered Mrs Driver grimly. Pry and Potter all you want. Two can play at that game.